Welcome to Leaders in Lending. I'm your host, Jeff Keltner. This week's episode features my conversation with Tony Hania, the Chief Credit Officer for the Consumer Bank at Key Bank, which is one of the larger regional banks based in Ohio. Uh, this was a really interesting conversation. We recorded it right before the New Year, so apologies for any uh, New Year's or holidays references. Uh, Tony really dives into why he thinks safe is risky. Oh, it's a catchphrase I really enjoyed. Um, some of his how he pushes his teams towards micro innovations, uh, a phrase I love, don't crush the butterfly regarding uh, Key's acquisition of Laurel Road, and the requirement to build proper infrastructure behind your digital innovations, as well as sharing some of his key insights that he shares with um, management trainees at the bank from his 30 years of experience in the consumer uh, banking industry. Uh, I thought it was a really fascinating conversation, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Tony, thanks so much for joining the podcast. I appreciate you making the time today during the holidays. Hey, Jeff, it's, uh, it's great to be here. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this conversation. I, one of the things, you know, I, I know you do uh, at Key Bank is to uh, kind of do some of the training sessions for rotational management and other leadership development programs. And, and you share some of your key pieces of wisdom after 30 years in the lending business. And I figured those are probably some useful insights to share with this audience as well. So I wondered if you could give me a little bit of history on what that program or those programs look like and then kind of the key, the key messages you try to deliver to those, those trainees. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, the uh, like many regional banks, we have rotational analysts that come in. We have internship programs. We have executive executive management programs, and uh, it, it's always exciting for me to talk to these folks. Uh, you know, young, getting started in the career, mm. and, and 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 one of the things that I I try to impart on them, I call it my three rules of job satisfaction, which are, you know, who do you work for, what do you do, and who do you work with. And, and um, none of it actually talks about how much money you're making. Uh, and, and I go through a progression where I say, you know, hey, the number one culture builder in your career is the person you're directly working for. And that person can right. uh, be your advocate. They can make your life easy. They can make your life more difficult. Um, and, and it's important, uh, you know, that, that you have a good chemistry with your manager. Uh, sec secondly, you got to be doing something that you feel passionate about and that you have purpose for. And, and that's and that's, uh, that, that's a critical thing. And then the one that you can control probably the least, but I still think it's very important, is, is who are you working with? And are, are you working with people that you, you can get along with and get together at, uh, after the office? Uh, and it's just, uh, to, to, me, to me, working with a good cohort of people is something that also is, a, uh, is an important driver of job satisfaction. I feel like you shortcut it to my usual end three questions with your best career advice because I, I feel like this is really good advice. And one of the things I've noticed is that people tend to over index on company benefits like brand name or, or whatever and under index on the individual they're working for and the individuals they're working with, which ultimately are like the 401k match or whatever are nice. The food is nice. Uh, but ultimately, like those people determine so much more about both your satisfaction in your job and your your learning and your progression in your career. I think it's a great it's a great point that those are I think people underappreciate how valuable those pieces of, pieces of the puzzle are in terms of your satisfaction. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right on. Uh, I actually got that advice when I was in grad school from a uh, I, I went mm -hmm. to grad school at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. No, it, and, 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 yeah. a, and a board member at the time, uh, Warren Brueggemann was his name, actually gave me that same advice. And so, so I'm just passing it on to the next generation and feel good about doing it because, uh, because I've I've lived it and uh, and he's right on the money. Yeah, you're curating the good advice. Do you, Do you have any advice for people on how you, you know? how you determine those things. Like if you're looking at a, a transfer to a new team within a company or interviewing for a new job, like, you know, it's how do you think about measuring or quantifying or evaluating those kinds of things in that process? Cause that's like a, it's easy to say, and it's going to be kind of hard to put into practice when you're in the, Hey, I'm looking for my next opportunity. How do I really think about finding the right fit from a, from a manager point of view or from a team point of view? Yeah, it's uh, th that's a great question. I'm not sure I have the perfect answer, but I will tell you that uh, it, at some point it dawned on me that you know you can't always pick your boss, right? You uh, yep. you you can pick your boss and you can pick what you do normally if you're going to a to a new position somewhere, um, and and I and I would just I would just suggest to people just be thorough around your due diligence. Try try to ask those questions um, and get to know the manager beyond just what's in the office. Everybody has a life beyond what's in the office. Um, and, uh, and to me, that, that'll shine a lot of, uh, you know, do you have similar interests? Um, 
Does, does the person value uh, opinions that are different than his or her own? And, and, how, do you, and how does that person, um, how does that person uh, treat his employees? Um, to the extent that you can talk to people that, that your new manager has, has uh, worked with, um, that's also great insight. Um, there's, yeah. there's a, I, I think there's a lot of strategies. And then, and then, of course, make sure you really understand what the job is. I mean, you know, I've been, I've been in situations that, that didn't work out so well like anybody else. And, you know, sometimes you take a job and you look back and say, geez, that might have not been what I thought this was at the very beginning. And then, uh, and then you spend the next six or nine months trying to figure out if it's really what you want to be doing. So uh, I would just say <laughs> do your diligence. Yeah. I think that's also good advice. I think so often we get caught up in the, you know, the job interview process is like a, it's like a contest that I'm trying to win. And you forget that sometimes you want to, you got to make sure you want to win. <laughs> right. And that, you know, you get, you get caught up sometimes in trying to, to succeed in getting the offer that you forget about. Like do I, it's determining through the process. Is this an offer I really want or not? Um, and it's good to remember to keep that in mind as well. It, it, it's okay to walk away, right? It, it, it is okay yeah. to walk away. And, and that is, um, that is something I probably didn't appreciate as well uh, when I was younger. And uh, I was really impressed. My sister is an accountant or was an accountant. And, uh, and she told me she interviewed for a job and literally stood up after the first interview. Uh, it was supposed to be for that day. And she says, this isn't a fit for me. I'm out of here. And, and, and to have that foresight and actually step up yeah. and leave, I thought, I thought it was pretty bold. But by the way, I'm not recommending that people do that, but I, but I think it's, uh, I, I think it's uh, certainly, uh, certainly a strategy. It is. Well, you know that it happens internally where the first interview of a candidate on the company side, somebody goes, this isn't going to work. And there's an email sitting around the other interview is going, don't spend too much time here. This is probably not going to work. So it makes total sense to you as a candidate to do the same thing. Like, I, I, I met the boss and like, that's not going to work. I don't know why I'm going to spend my next two hours here getting grilled. Like, I'm good. That's, that's impressive. I don't know that I have that kind of fortitude, but I, <laughs> I'm impressed, impressed that it's there. I, I know we'd also talked about, talked about some of your thoughts around driving innovation, particularly in the context of, you know, a bank uh, and maybe an institution, one of the institutions that is well insulated culturally, uh, typically from, from the concept of innovation uh, and how incentives play a role and how you get people to do that. I, I'm curious how you, how you think, you know, culturally at, at an institution like KeyBank, do you get, do you incentivize people to drive towards innovation? Like, how do you think about making that dynamic work? Yeah, I, I, I think there, I think there has to be and, and, and again, I'm going to I'm going to pirate something I read in a book, um, probably over a decade ago. But but the saying was safe. The, safe, the saying is safe is risky, right? And, and I'm not I'm not talking about my I'm not talking about my golf game here. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about like if you're in corporate America, I think the message there is everybody is constantly trying to innovate, um, and 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 to the extent that you're not innovating. Um, and you think you're playing it safe, it's actually very risky because people are passing you by. And mm -hmm. a great example of that, I think, in banking is the whole fintech revolution, right? And where, mm -hmm. where you know, banks, banks were slow to evolve around, you know, digital capabilities. And there was this huge marketplace that, you know, companies like Upstart and, you know, discovered and, and uh, you know, you could make delivery easy. And it was, it, you know, it, it was better for the client. And, it, it turned out to be a huge win. I think, you know, Jamie Dimon's comment around Square, I think it was, where he said, you know, that was something that the bank should have innovated, that the, the product mm -hmm. that almost everybody uses now at, at uh, food stores and barbershops, et cetera. But so, so the concept that, that safe is risky, um, but by the same token, uh, while you think about innovation, if you're going to fail, you have to be able to recognize failures quickly to move on, right? And mm -hmm. and. You know, 20 years ago when I was in banking, you know, projects were massive and projects uh, spent a lot of money. They took a long time, and then and then you deliver about 45 percent of what you thought we're going to deliver, and it was really really painful. Now it's like this new concept of you know minimum viable product and and uh, you, you know smart teams that do rapid implementations and development. Mm -hmm. I think is I think is helpful for innovations, and I think. I, and I think that banks have have moved in that direction, and I think it's I think it's good for competition, and I think it's good for banks. So I, I want to ask you one question around how you set up incentive structures. Because I think this, this statement that safe is risky, I think, is is very true. It's a fascinating way to put it, and I think it's it's possible to understand it at the institutional level, and yet make it untrue um, 
at the individual level from a career progression or a, you know internal point of view where the incentives say, I know we as an institution want to take risks because safe is risky. Um, but at a, at a personal level, I'm not incented to take risks and to drive that strategy. And I think that's so often where this kind of understanding of the strategy and the needs and the requirements of the market breaks down in terms of execution is how do I get individual team members, members incented to, to execute like safe is risky and to push the envelope a little bit. I'm curious if you have thoughts on that because that concept of how do I make that true for the individual so that they execute the way that the, the entity needs is I think a, a really challenging one, particularly for institutions that have been around in a time where safe wasn't as risky, where, where risky was risky and safe was safe. And a lot of the culture built up in, you know, in that environment 40, 50 years ago where there was, there was less of this drive for, for rapid iteration. So how do you think about creating an environment where individual team members feel like they can execute in a safe as risky kind of way and, and push the boundaries? Yeah, so, um, so it's, it's funny. I was actually looking to, to my left here because I have a stack of papers and I was, as I was going through annual <laughs> reviews, I'm starting the annual review process. The, uh, oh, yeah. You know, one, one of the things that I share with my managers and I share with everyone on my team is, is what differentiates a, somebody who is doing their job and, and meets expectations versus someone who exceeds. And, uh -huh. and the first word on that list is innovation. And, and if you come in and do your job every day, that's great. Um, but, but that doesn't mean you're going to outperform uh, in, yep. in your role. Um, so, so to me, and I make it very clear. I'm looking for people who go above, above and beyond. If I take it down to the, to the most junior analyst, if I ask a junior analyst for something and they hand me a report on that, they've done their job. You know, if they tell me three other things that I don't know already, right, they're, they're thinking above and beyond what they should. And in some sense, that's like what I would call like kind of a micro innovation, right? But, but if, yeah. I, if, if, I have, if I have people, on, and, I, and I set this expectation with my team, I said, look, if I'm okay recognizing failures early. We meet regularly, we discuss projects that are ongoing. Um, but, but innovation to me is something that is, uh, that is very important. And I'll use an example. Um, I think everybody remembers back to March, 2020, when we thought the world was about to end and credit losses were gonna go through, through the roof, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, what can we do to, to prepare for this? And we had a group of people who said, hey, let's, and, and, and I thought it was pretty good. Like we basically developed a, a whole new analytical way to look at clients that had asked for some sort of COVID hardship. And mm -hmm. we built a whole new collections valuation exercise around, you know, how would we get out of this? And when, people's, when people are off the COVID forbearance or the COVID hardship, you know, we're going to be prepared. We're going to be over-prepared. Mm -hmm. It turned out we didn't need it. But it was a great example, I think. It, I, look at I, I think it was a great example of where you know we had never yeah. done this before, and and we had some smart people who stepped up and uh, and did a great job. Yeah, that, certainly we all we all were in that moment going, we, we, whatever system and plans we had are not going to be not going to meet the moment. That was a great opportunity for some innovation. Um, I want to go back to something you said about you know the fintech revolution. Uh, and in kind of some of the digital digital execution and opportunity that we're seeing by fintechs, you guys acquired a fintech a little while back in Laurel Road. I, I wanted you to kind of walk me through how you thought about that decision and why you think it is that fintechs are able to deliver some ways in, in ways that banks haven't. And, and, and I think arguably maybe you're not well set up to do. Um, yeah, um, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, we, we acquired Laurel Road. I, I think it was early 19 now, my, my years get mixed up. And I, and I remember one of the first messages out of uh, one of our senior execs who, uh, who was instrumental in the deal was, don't crush the butterfly, right? And, and, and what, what that meant was, you know, let, let's, not, let's not think we're gonna take this acquisition like a bank and jam it into our systems. And if you think about it, FinTechs have a, have a great advantage in the fact that they, you know, traditionally have been at least when they start, they're single product focused. Mm -hmm. um, they, they build a they build a universal channel for all customers to come to them. Um, they make it easy. Um, they're focused on one thing primarily, uh, and that is providing good value and good service through the uh, through the uh, the technology interface. Mm -hmm. Switch that to to the banking model. Um, we have we have a thousand different outlets called branches that all tend to do things. Even though we want to believe they're all doing it the same, that's not that's not happening, right? It's all slightly different. People yep. have different level of skill sets. You have this human interaction going back and forth. Um, 
you, you, have, you have technology that feeds into legacy systems. Uh, it's much easier to do business with a bank if you're an existing customer of them because they already know you. Uh, mm-hmm. and, 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 and things around even validating IDs, it's just it's a more cumbersome legacy process in banks than it would be in a fintech. So, so one of the things that we made a concerted effort um, at, at Key was hey, we, li- we like the business, we, we like the technology, um, and, and, so, and, then, and then the idea is, yeah, certainly there's things that are going to come together in the back office, uh, but there's a lot that we can take from Lowell Road that can help leapfrog Key along digitally. Um, mm. and, and, and we were, you know, we had a discussion at the beginning, for instance, about, you know, how, how integrated should... If, if Laurel Road wanted to issue a uh, an unsecured personal loan, and KeyBank wants to, you know, uh, you know, KeyBank does unsecured personal loans, well, how closely should the systems and the technology yeah. and everything else marry, right? And and there is this there is this aspirational goal. Well, let's get them all in the same system. But then you know the the longer we have that discussion, it's like, well, why are we doing that? Because we're we're taking exactly what we bought. Mm-hmm. In one sense, we're taking exactly what we bought and, and trying to jam it in the key. Or if we do it the other way, we're taking we're taking a big project, and trying to get a thousand, yeah, a thousand different branches. And so, so right now we're you know we're we're still moving a little bit slowly on this, but we're uh, we haven't crushed the butterfly yet. And I, I think that's a, it's a good news story. <laughs> so, given that, how do you think about the priorities for digital transformation? I think it's something that fintechs, at least those that are not working with banks in substantial ways underappreciate, which is kind of the, the requirements for what a bank might want to do that are very different than what a fintech can do with open, you know, like Greenfield, I don't need to serve all these customers. I can just, wh- whoever can interact with me in the way I want is what my customer base will be, which is very different than a, a, a financial institution that has lots of history and different kinds of customers and branches and needs to be able to, to, to serve customers in a lot of ways. So given those differing needs that you as a, you know, as a regional bank have and what you need to serve, how do you think about what digital transformation means internal to the bank? Because I think it's very different than what a fintech might build off on their own, right? It's like, how does the bank really prioritize what you're going to do from a digital transformation point of view, um, given those kind of constraints and requirements? It, it's, I think it's easy to say, hey, you know, by such and such a date, we're going to have 35% of our loans will be given through the internet channel and by such and such a date we're going to have 65% and, th- and that's all That's all well and good. Um, wh- where I think it becomes very challenging is the legacy systems and the integration points obviously and, mm. and, and, and what that fundamentally means is this and th- this is, this is what, what I would bring to, the, to people. I'd say look at, we can't expect to be good at a business that we don't build up the proper infrastructure for that business. And mm-hmm. what I mean by that is, um, I, I spent a little time um, at, a, at a bank in Atlanta, and they had a nice fintech um, division. And when I was there, the fintech division was probably about eight or nine years old. Okay, and when I got the key bank, uh, one of our senior managers said, "Hey, we're going to be just like this other bank. Mm-hmm. They had this fit, nice fintech bank." But what was missing in the discussion was the fact that that fintech division of that other bank which ran completely separately had its own IT group had its own underwriting group had its own collections group um, they spent 10 years they spent 10 years of pain learning through fraud and, and evolution right and and it almost felt to me like the discussion was we want the results that they're having but we don't really appreciate what it took to build the infrastructure over 10 years in order to get there okay so fast forward to now and you know, we I think we have a very very measured approach that says, look, we we can't, we need to incrementalize so we can be we can be good on day one digitally if we're lending to our existing clients, and then and then we need to figure out the next step because we're going to need better fraud mm-hmm. tools, need better identi- identity verification tools if we're going to go beyond our existing client base. Um, and you know, look at I I think I think the agile squads that we have now in technology are making a difference. Um, mm-hmm. But I think it's also the reason why you see all these mergers of of mid to large size regional banks because mm-hmm. there's a lot of there's a lot of synergies around technology dollars that if you can take and I, and I forget what the number was it was like nine percent of each operating budget is technology mm-hmm. and if you can take two banks and put them together and reduce a lot of the back office expenses. And you can get to fifteen percent, um, mm-hmm. 
th th then you can start making a difference, right? But but ultimately, yeah. uh, that's that's how it has to evolve. Yeah, I, I love the focus on building the right infrastructure because I think that is so often what people mean digital is like, you know, we're just going to take something that kind of works okay now, like put a little web front end on it or a little mobile app front end, and that's like digital. And I feel like if you don't have the right pieces behind the scenes to plug that into to allow you to do ID fraud verification or whatever, then then you really are missing the boat and investing in an area where you can't you can't really win. I actually talked to a, a bank that they said we've totally digitized our um, auto lending. Said, okay, and I asked them to see the process, and you had to walk into a branch to close it. And I went, like, yeah, well, we don't have an e-sign yet. Well, well, how do you say you're digital if you have you, know, you don't have the pieces ready to really execute on that? And so there was a focus on yeah, we can take the app digitally but they didn't have the infrastructure to close the loan digitally. And so I, I just was like, you're not gonna really win in a digital world if you're, if you're executing without all the pieces. And it's, I think the investment in that kind of under beneath the covers kind of technology layer is, is underappreciated uh, in some of these things. And the sexy thing is like, we gotta look at the web, look at the, look at the application online. It looks so good. Um, and, and that infrastructure is so important. So I love that, that focus you have on, on making sure you have those, the, those back office pieces and, right so that you can yeah, really deliver. And when, when I talk about infrastructure, just to be clear, I'm talking about people, process, and systems, right? Because, yeah. because everything's new. And, and, and I think you hit it right on the money. Yeah. I, and the process, too, to me, that's, that's a great point because you've got to – I also see a lot of digital is like take our old process – it, but don't, don't change the process. Webify, and to your point, like ID verification, KYC. If I'm gonna if I'm gonna execute something digitally successfully, I can't use my old KYC process and try and make it digital. I need to figure out what are the tools available. How do I execute that? Um, so it is. It's really not just a technology thing. It is a, a people process and technology. It's a good point. So how do you think of that digital transformation playing? I guess I'll say between banks. But there's this concept of open banking that I think. The digitization of a lot of our interactions makes us think about how do I how do I move into a world where things are more interoperable? And there's this phrase open banking that gets tossed around. What, what are your thoughts around open banking and what that really means for the future of you know consumer experiences and, and institutions like Key? It makes me very nervous, quite frankly. Right? I mean, it's and and, and, and the reason why it makes me very nervous is it is a uh, it, it is it, it puts more onus on having a robust technology infrastructure, right? I mean, if what, what, one of the key advantages that regional banks have right now is the massive amounts of data that we have on clients. And, and, if, uh -huh. and if that data becomes you know, open, right? I mean, if that, if that data is available for anybody, um, you, know, you know, you could you could easily envision a world where, um, you know, clients can just hey, they they have their data, they can shop anywhere, and it it'll further commoditize. And mm -hmm. and in many ways, you wonder like, you know, will, will will there be a new evolution around retail banking because of that? And and, and what what would that look like? Because um, if 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 the power is in the data, whoever can figure out how to process that data to give a better customer experience is. Uh, is going to is going to win. Now, the second part of that I would say is that um, I still believe there is a place for human beings uh, and, mm. and, 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 and and branches and stuff like that. And the reason why I say that is like, hey, if things are relatively straightforward, if they're easy, and a lot of stuff is um, from a product standpoint or credit card application or, or a unsecured loan application, you know those those are pretty straightforward, um, but you know, I, I think you like me and everybody else. If you have a problem, and um, it, mm. it's becoming incredibly hard to actually talk to a human being, <laughs> you know what I mean, to, to resolve the problem. Whether whether it's whether it's uh, you know customer service on uh, at, at a financial services company, or whether it's an airlines or whatever. I mean, what was it? Delta Airlines had like a seventeen hour hold or something like that, like a, you know, <laughs> four months ago. Yeah, it was yeah. So insane. And um, ne nevertheless, um, I, I, th I think there will be an area for for branch banking, but but I do think that that the threat that uh, open banking provides has to be a catalyst for companies like Key to truly sharpen the focus around innovation and delivering on uh, and, and delivering on on the data it has today to provide that good customer experience. 
And, you know, Jesus, this, this is not too long ago, and I'm not even going to mention the, 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 the company I was with at the time, but everybody wanted to talk about, you know, that we were a relationship bank, we're a relationship bank, we're a relationship mm-hmm. bank. And, but it, it occurred to me, it's like, has anyone told the senior management team that we actually are not using any relationship data in our underwriting? Right? And this was, this was, this was, you know, this was, this was less than a decade ago. Okay. It was less yeah. than a decade ago, but, but people wanted to say we're a relationship bank. Well, how are you really a relationship bank if you're not using the data that you already have? Right. Yeah, yeah. And again, it becomes like, if, if you can make that happen, if you can make it happen effectively and efficiently, then I think, I think you get a competitive advantage. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny you talk about open banking. You talk about using that relationship data. And I talked to a bank, uh, who shall remain nameless, that uh, wanted to use some of their relationship data in underwriting and could not get their two systems to talk. And so they were using a third-party conduit to grab data from system A and put it in system B just so they could use a little of your depository transaction history or, or length of relationship in underwriting. And to your point, it really indicates to me that a lot of institutions have not. They may have the data, and it may conceptually give them a real advantage um, but they're not leveraging it to really provide that advantage. Like if you can't actually give uh, a consumer a better rate, not just for the relationship, but frankly, you know a lot more about them. If, you're, if you've got three products with them, you should understand their risk better, not just say, hey, I want to give you a good deal because you're already here uh, or because it's lower cost to me to serve you than to acquire a new customer, but because like, I actually can see your risk. Uh, and I think our relationship will mean you're more likely to pay me. We've seen this too, where a customer with a history with an institution all things being equal, we'll pay at a higher rate than someone who's walking first time into an institution. So you, you ought to be able to leverage that to not just, you know, for the good of the relationship do something, but, you, you know, with, with good reason uh, on a risk side. And, and yet most institutions, I think, are just in the early stages of really leveraging that data. Maybe open banking will be a bit of a, a kick to say, hey, you know, if you, don't, if you don't leverage your data to help the customer get a better experience, <laughs> it turns out we might be making that data available to others so they can do that. But it does feel like there's just so much green field for really intelligently taking advantage of that, of that data to provide better experience that there's, it's not as much for that. Plus it can be an opportunity it means you can, if you get good at leveraging that kind of data, it doesn't have to only be data on your own clients that you can use that on in a world where there's open banking and, and you can connect that data from other institutions. So I guess every opportunity is, every threat is also an opportunity if it looked at in the right way, right? I can completely agree, Jeff. <laughs> but the last thing I wanted to ask you about, Tony, is, you know, we've been in a, a kind of weird macroeconomic environment. I've talked about how, you know, we've had what would look like a macroeconomic stress period, and yet, you know, typically not the credit results that would indicate that we've actually been through uh, an economically stressed time period. What are your thoughts on, on how we should think about where we're at and if we even call this the cycle or a cycle? Like, what's the, what's the macro environment, and how do you think that shifts, you know, heading into, into next year? Yeah, I think, um, I, 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 and, and, and the data support this comment that you have unprecedented government transfers over the last 18 months, right, mm-hmm. staggering, that up until, I think, last month, the savings rate was literally at all-time highs. And, and, and I think it was something like, you know, five or six times higher than what it ever was in the past. And, and, and we yeah. finally started... You know, we've start, finally started to come back with, um, with, you know, some of the stimulus ending. But there's still a lot of stimulus out there, right? You have, you have this, uh, the child care credit. Now, obviously, uncertainty about the Build Back Better. Um, yep. you, have, you have student loan deferrals um, that out there extended again. And, and, and I'll tell you, I, think, I still think that, um, you know, my, my view is that at least what I've communicated internally because you know, three weeks ago, President Biden said we're not extending the student loan moratorium, um, and then you know after Build Back Better was kind of shut down a little bit by Joe Manchin. Yeah, by Joe Manchin. You had you had okay. Well, now now we're going going to extend this. Um, the first thing I did was call up kind of the business partners. So I said, look, I think we have a ton of opportunity now in in our uh, uh, loss plan. And because of X, Y, Z, right? And, and yeah, we got a little room in there, maybe. Right. And, and so, and, and so, I, so I think, I think the thing is, is well, how, how do you adjust? Because I, I actually think that that we're in for another, you know, year of pretty benign credit environments. And look, yeah. that doesn't mean I believe that a six twenty FICO is a prime FICO score. You know, you know, I mean, but, but, but I do think that if you're in a situation where there's opportunity and you can, you can get paid for risk, yeah. um, to, to me, it's like the environment's 
probably not going to get better than what we're seeing, I think, right now in our lifetime. It's, uh, yeah. it, it's hard for me to imagine. It's been a, it's been a very unique experience um, to, to go through this, this, this cycle, if you will call it that, because it has been both a, from a macro level indicators point of view, stress period, and yet, to your point, maybe the most benign credit environment that most of us have ever seen. And, and those two things don't usually <laughs> come in right. tandem, um, but, but this time they are. So it's, I think that does leave opportunity uh, for arbitrage if you can find, um, if you can find the it right areas. Makes it, as, as you pointed out to me earlier, it makes it tough on AI models, right? To, 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 to align unemployment and... Yeah, and, I was telling you, we have, we have a, in our model some kind of like you know, unemployment and um, you know, that correlates to increase in default. So you can kind of look at how, how risky is the current environment, how, how, and like started learning that like high unemployment is low risk. And I went, ah, high unemployment plus high government stimulus might be low risk. High unemployment with low government stimulus is still high risk. So we, we had to tweak models to, because, you know, you were starting to learn that, you know, unemployment didn't, didn't impact credit performance because, you know, we had really high unemployment for a while and, and really no impact on credit performance for at least the unsecured loans. And that was the kind of an odd lesson we had to go into the system and go ahead. <laughs> There's an extraneous yeah. factor here that needs to be accounted for. Otherwise, you're going to learn a really bad lesson. Um, one of those truths of AI that if you get if you, take, if you give it the wrong data, it, it will learn the lessons that you give it, and you got to be careful what those lessons are. Um, so that was a, it been an interesting time period from that point of view. Yeah. It, well, Tony, is there anything you had on your mind that you want to talk about today that I didn't ask? Uh, if not, we can hop into my three questions. But I always like to give you a, an opportunity. Um, you know, I, I, I will just tell you that. Um, you know, I, I, I do think I do think that there is a uh, there's reason to be optimistic going into into mm -hmm. 2012. I look at we, we, we have the gamut. Um, I know there's inflation. I think the inflation is going to stick around. Um, home prices, I think, will stabilize. Um, mm -hmm. But but I but I think there is reason to be optimistic from from a lending standpoint. Um, I think even with even with some of the uh, stimulus that's been that's been stopped, I do believe that we have. Uh, uh, you know, opportunity to grow and, and grow smartly as an industry. Uh, I, I, I think uh, I think housing prices will stabilize. I think uh, I and, and I do think that um, I, I I continue to be optimistic that you know we, we we're we're facing the uh, the last big wave of this of this pandemic and I and I'm certainly hopeful. I I, I think figuring out how how we live with it is going to be incredibly important, which. Which you know brings me to the whole back to the office thing, Jeff. And I know you and I have mm. talked about this. One of the biggest challenges I see is how do we how do we cultivate future leaders uh, in a remote environment? It's it's incredibly incredibly difficult. Um, and you know I, I I try to encourage people to to the extent possible. We we have a new mobile uh, you know mobile environment where people can come in, reserve a spot, but it's not permanent. And you know we mm. try to get together periodically so we can see each other face to face because you know look at we're a species that needs human interaction and uh, and, yeah. and and video conference doesn't lend itself to spontaneity or serendipity or hey what do you think about these numbers and what do you think about this you want to go grab a bite to eat you want to go grab a pint after work whatever it is yeah. uh, it's pretty pretty darn tough to do that through uh, through a zoom call yeah it's gonna be really interesting to see how that plays out I feel like everybody has had their plans and none of them are Whatever your plan was six months ago, it's not your plan today because the, the world keeps throwing things at us. But I, I, I'm optimistic you're right that we are on, I won't call it the last wave of the pandemic because I think ultimately this is going to become an endemic issue where like we're not going to get to zero COVID. We're going we're gonna to learn how to live with it um, uh, through vaccines and natural immunity and other things. And we'll get to a place where we, we come back to some semblance of normal. I think some things will, I, I may not be getting on airplanes without masks for a while, but I, I'll be getting on airplanes. Uh, and so I think there's, we're going to get back to that. But then the sense of how do we, what does the new normal look like is going to be really interesting. And we are a social species. Like, I, you know, we came up with an interesting plan. I don't know if we haven't really talked about this, but we, we're going in a couple of days a month, um, as opposed to a couple of days a week at Upstart. But we're doing it where the team you work, you, it's not a couple of days whenever you want. It's like this team is getting together in this office for these days because we want you to build a culture and camaraderie. And so we want to make sure that we're kind of, Focusing that time on the you know the cross-functional teams that need to get together, not just like your marketing team or your sales team or your public like cross-functional working groups are getting together in different months. So it's we're trying to find a way to create that opportunity for serendipity. But 
um, and for interaction. But it's going to be a really fascinating thing to see how the world evolves because there also have been benefits to being at home more, right? And people are enjoying the flexibility. I think we're going to have to find a way to, to meld those two things in the future. It'll be very interesting. Yep. All right. Well, Tony, as you know, I got three questions I use to end every podcast. Uh, I feel like the first one, what's the best piece of career advice you've ever gotten? I feel like we spent the first 10 minutes talking about I'm we definitely did. We can skip that one. Yeah, it's it's. it's People, we'll let you off the hook on that one. I feel like I feel like you covered it pretty well. Um, the second one is, what's the best piece of you know consumer lending or consumer banking advice you've ever gotten? You know, I, I, I think there's I think there's two things, and, and these are two pearls of wisdom that uh, that I try to share with people occasionally too. Right? Is that first of all. Uh, Everything needs to be better, faster, and less expensive, right? If, if, you, if you're not, if you're not, and, and this goes back to innovation. If you're not innovating every day, right, then you're not getting better, faster, less expensive. Um, then, then uh, there's an issue. And, and the other thing is, which is very much related to that, um, and, and I'm going to be careful how I frame this, right? But um, we're in we're in a fairly high we're in a highly regulated business, right? And um, which which means that. Even if you're innovating, um, you know there's there's certain inherent limitations in that. Um, and if you have a competitor that's doing something that you can't figure out, um, then somebody's somebody's probably cheating. And I have some examples of that. Um, and and I, I don't even know if I can say this on this webcast, but you know, like let's let's hypothetically say, for example, that that one of your competitor banks has an ex excessively high success rate in like cross sell or something like that, and mm -hmm. then. And, and you can't figure that out, um, but they're the poster child or, or, their, or their expense ratios are very, very good and you can't figure that out, right? I've seen this about four or five times in my career where you know institutions have been held up as like the examples of how great everything is and why can't we be like this company? Why can't we be like that? And yeah. virtually every one of them turned out to be a little bit of a shell, right? This is about hard yeah. work in a regulated industry. And, um, and yeah, you can get smart people and you can get incremental adva advantages, uh, but but it's pretty hard to get uh, an advantage that is just a, uh, you know, an, an avalanche of good news, if you know what I mean. Yeah, so. I do. And I, I do think we've always said here, learning to iterate quickly and learn rapidly in the construct of properly following regulations and requirements so that, that are important and there for good reason is like it's a magic thing if you can if you can do both because people tend to either be like move fast and break things and we're like okay, no breaking things here there's there's things <laughs> there's things you can't break this you know real important stuff going on and, and regulated and it's people's money right you're not you can break things but you also can't be you know so slow that you're you're waiting forever to make decisions so finding that balance of being fast and yet uh, respectful of the regulation is, I, I think, a magic sauce for anybody in financial services. Like that's the the secret. The secret you got to find. And my last question: What's your bold prediction for the future? For oh, uh, geez, I guess, I got, well, we're looking at a new year, so it's a great time for bold predictions. Look, at, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to do two here. Okay. Um, All right. I like and, two. Um, and, and and one is, you know, look at it, if you have a college age or, or someone who just got out of college and they have they have federal student loan debt. Uh, I don't think they're making a payment for the rest of this year. I don't. I don't think. I think that stimulus, which is you know roughly three to four hundred dollars per person, um, is uh, is going to be with us. Uh, I, I find it very unlikely that uh, President Biden would remove this three months before a midterm election. So, um, so I'll tell you. I, I, and, and by the way, that's why I'm bullish on 2022 from a credit standpoint. I just. I just don't think. You have 40 million, 40 million people in the country who are going are, are gonna to be on some sort of a stimulus payment holiday throughout the year. Um, that's number one. The, the yeah. second one, and, and I don't know how bold this is, um, but, but, I, but I think there's no other way forward than for, for banks to, uh, to partner more with, uh, with fintech companies and like, you know, like we did with Lowell Road and figure out mm -hmm. the path forward. I, I, don't think, I don't think it's feasible for banks to think that they can invest, uh, you know, invent their own. And I think it's going to be great for the fintech innovation that happens outside of banking and, and to see those uh, those entities merge together. I think it's going to be really exciting. Uh, and I think it's going to continue in earnest over the next half decade, decade and beyond. Yeah, I, I, I love that as a, a bold prediction. I do think there's those who think the fintechs will replace the banks and there are those who think the fintechs will die uh, and the banks will just eat them. And I, I think both of those are foolish. Like ultimately, they're going to come together and offer highly properly regulated, properly delivered services um, in conjunction with banks. That, that to me feels like 
the future um, as well. So I like that as a bold prediction. Hopefully, if you're right, I'll still have a job in, in five or 10 years. So <laughs> I can come back and, and have a conversation about that. Well, Tony, this was a great conversation. I appreciate your making the time over the holidays. Uh, uh, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Jeff, th thanks for having me. And it was, uh, it's, uh, it's great to be part of this and, uh, and hope you, uh, hope you have a great new year. You too. Thanks.